Hello YouTubers, welcome to another Generation Behind Hi-Fi video and today I'm going to be disassembling this Klipsch R10 SW subwoofer. If you're new to this home theater or two channel stereo hobby, then you probably know who Klipsch is. They make all kinds of Hi-Fi products that meet a variety of budgets. I have been enjoying this hobby since the late 90s and I didn't start out with my Bowers & Wilkins 800 series speakers and Macintosh amplifiers. It took me decades to get to that point. I, like most people, started out by purchasing budget friendly gear from the likes of JBL and Klipsch to get my feet wet into this hobby to see if I would actually enjoy it. So if you were like me 25 years ago, then you can't go wrong with Klipsch or JBL gear. I think they offer one of the best price to performance ratios in the industry. I purchased this Klipsch R10 SW subwoofer for only $200 and that got me a ported enclosure, 10 inch subwoofer and a 300 watt amplifier. That's pretty amazing that a manufacturer can design, build and sell a subwoofer with this kind of performance for so little money and still make a profit. So that got me thinking, how's a $200 Klipsch subwoofer constructed? Let's find out. Alright, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to remove the driver. Let's get right to the business end of this thing. Of course you want to be extremely careful when you're operating a uh, battery operated tool like this. You don't want to slip and hit the surround so I'm being very careful. And I'm also being careful not to press or put too much weight on the tool pressing down fighting against the, uh, the screw coming out. So I'm just letting the tool do the work. Well, the driver's nothing special considering that this is only a $200 subwoofer. This is a very basic, lightweight driver with a stamped steel frame, ceramic magnet, and a non-vented pole piece. Clips refers to the comb material as IMG, which stands for Injected Molded Graphite. I'm guessing the comb material is a type of polypropylene mixed with a fiber reinforced material like a resin or epoxy. If anyone knows the exact makeup of this comb material, please let me know by leaving a comment down below. Unfortunately, there isn't a lot of info on what materials make up IMG. I was curious about the impedance of this subwoofer, so I checked it with my ohm meter and found it had an impedance of 4 ohms. Next, I put the driver on my scale and found it weighed only 5 pounds and 9.9 .9 ounces. I bet a simple driver upgrade would do wonders for not only the bass output, but also for sound quality. Now I'm going to start looking at replacement drivers to see if I can improve the sound and bass from this cheap subwoofer. I should be able to find a very decent replacement for around $50. At the end of this video, I'll let you know what I decided on. Now I'm going to remove the amplifier so we can get an idea of how this cabinet is constructed. Let's see if Klipsch invested some money in here. Wow, the construction of the cabinet isn't as bad as I thought it would be for a $200 subwoofer. 
I definitely wasn't expecting any bracing or polyfill at this price point, but it's there. It appears Klipsch decided to devote a little more of this sub's budget towards the cabinet versus the driver. The added bracing and polyfill should help reduce cabinet resonance. So now you're probably wondering what kind of MDF did they use to construct this cabinet with. The front baffle and support braces inside are all made out of 3 quarter inch MDF. I have no way of measuring the size of the cabinet, but I would assume they are also made out of 3 quarter inch MDF. The back of the cabinet where the amplifier is mounted is made out of thinner 5 8 inch MDF. The long port tube is made out of cardboard and measures around 12 inches in length. Here's another angle of inside the cabinet from the back side where the amplifier mounts. You can get a good look at the long port tube from this angle. I'm guessing Clips engineers had to think of a way to get a rather cheap bass driver to produce deep bass and they did this by installing a longer port design that has a length of 12 inches. If you remember from your high school car audio days, then you probably remember reading about how a longer port design in a box can tune the frequency lower and a shorter port design will tune the frequency higher. According to Eclipse, this sub can only go down to 32 Hz plus or minus 3 dB, which is about what I would expect from a sub costing only $200. But you're also missing quite a bit of the deep notes in some movie tracks, some of which can go down to 20 Hz or more. I think Klipsch engineers did a good job with this box design considering the cost constraints that they had to work within. The Klipsch R10SW is equipped with a Class D amplifier that is rated at 300 watts peak and 150 watts RMS. The features on this amplifier include a low pass crossover, phase control, dual purpose low level stereo RCA or LFE RCA inputs, gain control, and a power switch. After pulling the amplifier out from the cabinet, I immediately noticed how lightweight it is. If I had to guess, this amplifier probably doesn't weigh more than a few pounds. The amplifier board contains capacitors made by K2, and I couldn't find a lot of information on the internet about these capacitors, but did find out that they are made in China. Again, none of this is surprising considering this is a $200 subwoofer. During my listening test, this subwoofer performed pretty decently in a home theater setting especially when you consider it only cost 200 bucks. I don't want to go into too much detail about the sound quality and performance of this subwoofer, as I'll be doing that in a review later on. If you remember earlier in this video, I said I'd be looking for a replacement driver for my Klipsch subwoofer in the hopes of improving its performance. Well, I was on eBay burning some time and I found that a lot of Martin Logan Dynamo Series subwoofers are being parted out on there. I guess the amps in these subwoofers don't last long and owners are parting these subs out instead of fixing them to recoup some of their costs. I was able to purchase a 10 inch subwoofer from a Dynamo 700W model for less than $45 shipped to my house. That's not bad considering this driver has a vented pull piece, double stack magnet assembly, more excursion, and higher power handling. If I was to buy an equivalent subwoofer from Parts Express, I'd probably be spending at least $100 or more. If anyone has any specs on this driver, please post them in the comments section it would be much appreciated. While I did get a good deal on this driver, unfortunately I can't find a data sheet on it anywhere. I think Martin Logan used ScanSpeak as a supplier in their Dynamo series subwoofers. I know there are a lot of variables at play that must be taken into account before dropping in a new driver in a cabinet, but even still, I would imagine this driver will perform quite a bit better than the original unit. Hopefully I can drop this in without too much trouble but I am expecting that some modifications will probably be needed in order to get this driver to fit. I'll be doing a separate video on how this upgrade worked out, so stay tuned on my Project Klipsch subwoofer series. And that's my video on how a Klipsch R10 SW subwoofer is constructed. If you'd like to see more videos like this, make sure to hit that like button. I was thinking of doing a disassembly video of my new RHEL 1205 next, but I think I'll wait and see how the likes turn out for this video before I invest my time and energy to film another one. Hopefully this video will give you an idea on how the Klipsch R10SW is constructed. I don't know about you, but for $200, I was pretty impressed. So long and happy listening.